Hi, so I'm Charlotte Frasa, a second year PhD student in computational neuroscience. And today I want to answer some questions that you guys have actually asked on YouTube about neuroscience and computational neuroscience, such that you hopefully can become a little bit a better computational neuroscientist. So I in general want to make these type of videos a little bit more, these Q&A type of videos, because I really enjoy making them. And I also sometimes feel a little bit bad that I don't answer all your questions, because I think some of the questions are quite difficult and need a little bit more explanation, so I don't always feel comfortable typing it up. So I hope you really enjoyed this video and if you have any other questions that I haven't answered during the video please put them down in the comments below and perhaps I will answer them next month. So the first question I got is from Daniel Tenacho and he asked hey I'd like to know if you could shed more light on computational neuroscience as a master's degree. So maybe some of you know but I've done the cognitive neuroscience master's degree with a specialization in computational neuroscience but they call it the track in natural computing and neurotechnology but this basically comes down to computational neuroscience so we studied the following courses so we had computational neuroscience machine learning we also had hands-on neuroscience so this were these kind of anatomy type of classes quantitative brain networks complex adaptive systems AI for neurotechnology and cognition and complexity and as someone that has done this master I think the biggest benefit actually from this particular master was that it was a research master so you had about a year full of courses and then you had a year where you could actually do some research with a lab and I think this really taught me what research is all about and also the type of skills that you need because I think doing a lot of courses in computational neuroscience for example you kind of get a feeling that there's a lot to learn and that it's really fun and everything but I think doing the actual work of finding those things out is quite different and I think the earlier you can get some research experience the better and that's also why I would not necessarily recommend people to do a master's program so I think the only reason I would do a master's program is if I knew my job required it or if I knew that I could get some research experience and I wanted to become a PhD student and the type of master's degree that you do then for computational neuroscience I don't even think it necessarily has to be in computational neuroscience if you want to be a PhD after. The next question is by Daniel. He asks, I'm starting soon my bachelor in computer science and neuroscience and what is the best attitude or system to go about reading scientific articles like those you shared? Have any tips or suggestions? Okay, I think maybe at a certain point I want to make a full video about how I go about reading articles. And I do know different people have different preferences. So I'm just going to give you my system. So the way I do it is I first try to find the articles, right? And I've said this before. I do this, for example, on Twitter where I follow a few of my favorite researchers and they usually publish a lot of their work. I also get articles from the lab that, for example, my professors recommend that I read. And there are also a few historical articles almost that are just really remarkable in the field and that almost everyone has read. So that's usually how I go about finding them. And then the second step is quick reading them. And the way I do it is that I usually mark papers with this app called Instapaper. And it doesn't always work well for paper, so I do have to give this little caveat. But Instapaper is really nice. I use it to mark articles I run to read. Um, also just little snippets on the internet that I think may be interesting. And then it's all in this almost news type newspaper type of format and then I have the app Instapaper actually on my iPad so it looks like this and so for example right now I'm reading this article from Nature obtaining genetic insights from deep learning um so the way I would go about it is I would usually read the abstracts I would look at the figures so all the figures um that are in the paper and I see if I understand them and usually if I understand them that kind of means that the paper doesn't contain anything new so yeah that's usually how I do it on Instapaper and the fact is that I also have my Instapaper linked to my Notion. So I have it linked to true Readwise. So on my Notion, I then have all the notes that I made on Instapaper automatically on my Notion, which I personally really like. Yeah, so this is quick reading them. And sometimes I find that in the papers by quick reading them, that I really see that, oh, this is a super important paper for my work, or I can learn something really new, or it's just in general a really interesting paper. And then I usually um, 
put it over to Zotero. And Zotero is this paper manager app. It's kind of like this reference manager app, but I really like it to really deep read papers. Um, by that, I just mean fully reading all the papers, really marking all the parts that I find interesting. And usually also what I do is I also look up the code that people used, um, really take a look at the algorithms and see if I can implement it. But as you can hear, this takes really long, like deep reading a paper or fully reading a paper takes me almost three hours maybe. So that's why I almost never do this. Like most papers I quick read and I think I quick read a paper and anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes so I can read a lot of papers that way. And the deep fully reading I only do with like one paper maybe every month. Like really not that often it, this happens. So the next question is from Yashi and I actually got this question a lot as well. They ask, hey, is there any difference between computational neuroscience and cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience? And I think this in general is kind of a hard question because I don't personally like to really define um, the borders of neuroscience. I think some people prefer to call themselves a cognitive neuroscience, a cognitive neuroscientist versus a computational neuroscientist. But there have been many papers written about this. And for example, one is from Nature that I will show you real quick. So they really show in this figure, for example, the distinction of the um, cognitive science parts, computational science parts and artificial intelligence. And in their paper, they state cognitive science starts from computational theory, decomposing cognition into components and developing representations and algorithms from the top down. And computational neuroscience proceeds from the bottom up, composing neuronal building blocks into representations and algorithms thought to be useful components in the context of the brain's overall function. So you can kind of see these three building blocks where AI is also a part of it, but I don't really fully agree with this. This is like a really clear distinction that if you do computational neuroscience, you only do bottom up. And if you do cognitive neuroscience, you only do top down. But personally, I actually actually think there is a deeper almost philosophical reason why people will call themselves one versus the other and I personally really like um, from the computational brain what they say about computational neuroscience. So they say the expression computational in computational neuroscience reflects the role of a computer as a research tool in modeling complex systems such as the network ganglia and brains. Okay, using the word in that sense, one could have also computational astronomy or computational geology. In the present context, however, the word primary force is its descriptive connotation, which here betokens the deep-seated conviction that what is being modeled by a computer is itself a kind of computer. And that's not to say that computational neuroscientists think that the brain is a computer. That's of course not true, but they do see a lot of similarities, right? And I also think in general, for example, I work in neuroimaging and I think this is almost in the border between cognitive sciences and computational um, neuroscience and AI. I think neuroimaging computational neuroscientists almost fall exactly in the middle of all of these fields. So yeah, I think in general, it's just really hard to have clear borders between these fields. But if you want to say, I think classically, usually when you go from a bottom up approach and you really try to model single neurons, that was usually considered computational neuroscience. And then when you go from a top down approach where you really try to think of behavior and make more psychological models for behavior, or neuroscientific models for behavior. That's cognitive neuroscience. Then the next question is from Sam. Amazing video, Charlotte. Could you please recommend any request for people like me who are doing research in the neurobiology of language? So for people that don't know, neurobiology of language is under to understand cognitive and neural organization of human language skills. So personally, um, I know in the Donners, there's of course the group from Peter Haghoort. And here's a, on, I will put an online lecture from him down below. That's the core and beyond in a language ready brain. I think that's quite a good summary of the field. Also, if you look at his website, the neurobiology of language at the Donners, there are a lot of different groups that are doing research in it right now. So I think you can look up those groups and look at the papers they've written. So you have, for example, neurocomputational models of language, neuropragmatic information structure, dialogue, etc. I also like personally this course from Coursera and it's not specific for language, but it has 
there is one week where they discuss language or the neurobiology of language, the neuroscience of language, and that's understanding the brain, the neurobiology of everyday life. And I think the teacher is really nice. She explains it really well. It is a little bit surface level. So if you're already a little bit more advanced or you already know quite a lot about neuroscience, I think it may be a bit too easy. And if it is too easy, I also like this course called The Human Brain on MIT. They also have one um, talk, I think one or two, uh, specifically about language. And lastly, I came across this super interesting paper from Nature lately, which is called An Investigation Across 45 Languages and 12 Language Families Reveals a Universal Language Network. And I personally find this really interesting because usually uh, language studies are done with people that speak Eurocentric languages, such as like English, French, German, just because it's usually easier to reach these type of people. But these scientists really made an effort to include as many language families and languages as possible in their study, such that they could make more comprehensive conclusions for the entire human population and not just uh, Europe and America. Okay, and then the last question, and this question I get a lot as well, and maybe I'll do a video about it, but how do you read neuroscience books, sequentially read or thinking, read where you take notes? Um, so let's take a neuroscience book that I refer to quite a lot, The Computational Brain by Patricia Churchland. I got this book because it was on sale. <laughs> That's the only reason I got it. And as you see, I bookmark quite a lot. And the way I read these types of books is usually when I'm researching something, I kind of want to have the general consensus of the field. And then I usually look at a book and I know kind of in my head which books have which topics. And I look at that book to kind of see what the general consensus of the field is. Because as I have said in a previous video, a lot of these neuroscience books are a little bit outdated because the field moves so fast that some of the things that are stated five years ago are already not true. But it is usually good to get a general feeling of what kind of things are considered um, accepted neuroscience knowledge. So I do think, for example, this book, The Principles of Neuroscience, has almost every topic you can think about in neuroscience. And it's a really good place to start. For example, if you want to do research in attention, you read their chapter on attention and see what kind of terms are used, um, which kind of papers are quoted, these kind of things. So I almost never read a book back to back. I almost always just read specific chapters that I find interesting. So yeah, these were the five questions I picked for this week. I hope you enjoyed this kind of video a little bit. And if you have any question you want to have answered for the next month, when I perhaps make another video like this, please let me know down in the comments below and I will try to carefully answer your question as well. And otherwise have a lovely week and see you next time. Bye!